Today, I'm going to read this section called The Classmate Stories from my book, Expecting the Good. After John Luke's death, I wanted to learn more about him before he met our mother. So I reached out to some of his fellow West Pointers and asked if they had any stories to share. Thankfully, I received some responses. The first one is from Don Mooney, his roommate at West Point. He is retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel. This is basically an excerpt from his uh, speech at John Luke's Benny's Wake, which is part of the after the funeral. I would generally say that John Luke was my brother. The last text that he sent me, he signed it brother. He was the best man at my wedding. He was the best man, literally. He had a great effect on people, and he's one of the reasons why I married this woman right next to me. You know, guys, I was a stellar cadet. And laughter in the background. I never got into trouble until I met Narcissa. John Luke probably went out with her as much as I did because I was in confinement. I was confined in my room and was confined to West Point and I couldn't take her off post. When I was getting ready to graduate, John Luke asked me, Don, what are you going to do with Narcissa? I said I was going to love her and then leave her. Then he said to me, you know that she's smarter than you. Laughter in the room. Those were exact words. And so I consequently went and proposed to her. On our wedding day, and again, he was our best man. He was supposed to have the wedding rings. We are in our dress blues. And the preacher asks for the rings. Where are the rings? Well, John Luke had left him back at the house. So we had to rush back to Narcissa's house, climb to the second floor in our dress blues, and get the rings. Anyway, John Luke was quite a man. I know that we all love him, and that's why we're all here. He was my best friend, my best man, and my brother. The next response was from Joseph Wasiak, retired colonel, U.S. Army. Friends of mine from years ago would be surprised to hear me say that I think cars are overrated, way overrated, considering I spent the majority of my first year rebuilding a car in a garage in Fails Gate, not far from West Point, and that statement just doesn't make sense. But I never really did get excited about cars. They were always just a means of transportation and not much more. Unless, of course, we're talking about British sports cars, especially old British sports cars. MG, T-Series, and A's, Triumph, TR6s, Morgans, Austin Healey, 3000s. They were all a thing of beauty and just oozed cool. And the king of them all, the coolest, the baddest, and the most beautiful was without a doubt the Jaguar XKE. You can say what you want about Corvette, Trans Am, Dodge, Charger, Lotus, etc., but nothing produced by any other car maker on any continent before or since can compare to it. It had looks, power, and more style than you could shake a stick at. Hell, it looked like it was doing 120 miles per hour sitting in a parking lot. I've never owned one. My passion ran to MGTDs but I still lust for one even to this day. And back in the spring of 1975, there were two of our illustrious classmates in D4 who had the good taste in financial wherewithal to make the XKE their first car. It was Mike Gennetti and John Luke Nash. Gennetti had a gorgeous, correct me if I'm wrong, a 1975 silver XKE with a V12 engine, and John Luke purchased a used 1969 XKE, which was a beautiful pale yellow. I never rode in Mike's, but I did have a chance to ride with John Luke. He visited me one weekend at the garage where I was busy rebuilding my 51 MG with the help of a captain assigned to the military science department at the academy 
and his name was Hal Fuller. John Luke had Fuller do some minor work on his JAG, and then he gave me a ride back to the academy in time for Sunday supper formation. The car ran nicely, and I remember very clearly the sensation of being pushed back into the seat as John Luke accelerated down the road from a dead stop. I also still remember thinking to myself, easy man, you don't need to run it to the red line every time before you shift. Needless to say, John Luke really liked to accelerate quickly and drive fast. Now, spring break in April 1975 was a special time for all of us, mostly because it meant a week's leave, warmer climate, female companionship, and cruising in our new cars. Unfortunately for me, the MG was still being assembled, so as the rest of you all headed south, I made my way to the garage in Vale's Gate to what I hoped would be the final days of work before I was finished with the rebuild. I can't begin to tell you how that went over with Jen, my fiance, who still reminds me about it to this day. I remember clearly that first afternoon working on my car and the phone call that came into the shop. Fuller answered it, listened quietly, said some things and then hung up. Apparently one of my classmates from my company had broken down in the highway and was having his car towed to the shop. Later that day, a tow truck pulled into the lot with a beautiful yellow jag in tow and John Luke, looking rather sheepish, riding shotgun. After it was unhooked, we pushed it into one of the bays to have a look. Now, XKEs have a unique way of accessing the engine compartment. You unlatched the front body near the windshield and the whole thing swung up on a set of hinges near the front end. It's really cool. The frame is even better. It's a tubular arrangement that looks like something out of a Formula One race car. What we saw was even more impressive. The engine block had a half dollar size hole in the side. That was cool too, since I've never seen that before. Apparently, John Luke had thrown a rod and it blew its way out the side of the engine. Remember my comment about running it to the red line between shifts, it caught up with him. Now, most of us would have been in a state of panic at the sight of that engine, or at least near total depression, and John Luke probably was. Fortunately for him, he could not have brought it to a more capable or resourceful mechanic, Hal Fuller. In no time, Fuller was on the line, located a new engine from a salvage yard, and had it delivered the very next day. So for the next few days, John Luke kept me company at the repair shop as he and Fuller worked to pull the old engine and install the new one. If I recall correctly, it only took them about two days to finish the job and the car was running again and John Luke was on his way. Fuller didn't even charge him for the labor, only for the engine and the parts. And that is how I got to spend spring break our first year with John Luke in an auto repair shop in Vailskate. Eventually, I finished the MG, but that is another story for another time. I don't know what happened to that Jag or how long John Luke kept it. Most of us who owned a British sports car came to the realization that they are more of a hobby and less of a reliable means of transportation. So we sold them and lived to regret it years later. John Luke probably did too. But I would imagine that he's now cruising in the land of perfectly maintained highways, neatly banked curves, 30 cent gas, looking down at us from the driver's seat of an XKE. I run in it to the red line every time. The next story shared is by Keith Huber, who's retired U.S. Army Lieutenant General. He actually wrote the foreword to this book. General Huber took the time to call me and talk about John Luke. He and John Luke graduated from West Point at the same time, but did not hang around each other as cadets. John Luke was in D4 and Keith was in G4 at West Point. Keith also remembers that 1969 Yellow Jaguar 
that John Luke owned. It was infamous on campus, apparently. The Jaguar had to be parked at an incline because the starter didn't work properly. And John Luke had to roll the car down a hill to get it started each and every time. John Luke was memorable to Keith because of his physical size, very tall and athletic. He rarely got angry, always had a sense of calmness about him, and was very resilient in any situation. And I could definitely vouch for that. They both went through the Special Forces training together in January 1978 and obtained the Green Berets. Both went immediately to scuba school in Florida, which is a combat diver school and is noted to be very difficult to pass. It was abnormal to do something like that so soon. Keith remembers that they were up at 4.30 a.m. to make sure the 69 Yellow Jaguar started and both would swim as a warm-up before class began. The combat diver school lasted for a month. There were 38 attendees at the beginning with a chosen class leader, yet only 11 graduated the combat diver school. So that is less than 30% completion. The training consisted of exercise with weights in the pool. They basically drown you with the weights, then revive you. The cycle was repeated multiple times each day per student. The original class leader quit. He was a captain from the army and was older than Keith and John Luke. The class leaders were chosen alphabetically so then Keith became the class leader. The last test was a harassment swim, and it was down to the final 11 participants, those that didn't drop out yet. The test requires two participants. And if you do the math, someone would have to go twice since 11 is not an even number. John Luke had already passed the final test and Keith was the last person, but he didn't have a partner. So John Luke volunteered. The drill was for 10 minutes and both participants have to stay underwater at the bottom of the pool for the entire 10 minutes. A uh, double hose is used. It is large in diameter and flexible, not thin or high pressure. You have to forcibly breathe through it. You and your partner have to share breaths for this double hose, which is called buddy breathing. To stay under, you make a knot at the bottom of the pool, wrapping your legs around each other, intertwined and in sharing that hose. Remember that John Luke did this already earlier that day, and he hadn't fully recovered from his first drill. So he got nauseous and threw up in the hose. Keith had to suck in John Luke's vomit in order to breathe. Oh my God. The instructors were amazed that neither of them broke the surface. Keith credits John Luke for helping him pass the combat diver school, and it was only because John Luke volunteered. After the combat diver school, Keith was sent to Panama and got a scuba team. Then John Luke was assigned to Germany, and that's when he met Stan Moore. <laughs>